this your first time starting seeds or have you tried and it hasn't gone well? You're in luck because what I'm gonna be doing today is we're gonna be going step by step. Yes, I will be holding your hand as we go through how to start seeds for beginners. Okay, let's first talk soil. There's kind of a few major options you see. You usually see potting mix, garden soil, and then sometimes you'll see separately compost. And you may be thinking, so which one do I start the seeds in? Well, two of those you want to avoid for sure. Actually, probably all three. If they're coming in a big giant bag, that's not for you. What you wanna be looking for is something like this. Something that says seed starting. And there is a reason that we wanna look for seed starting because in those other bags are big chunks of wood. Here is a bag of garden soil. If we look at this soil, you're gonna notice big chunks of wood. And this is actually beneficial when we have plants that we put into the ground because they'll allow for slower release of water. But when we are putting teeny tiny baby plants, well, just imagine that little sprout trying to push this thing up and this thing up. It's just gonna crush them to death. And that's no good. So one of the differences between this big old bag of garden soil and this bag of seed starting mix is a lot of those chunks have been taken out and it'll look like that. You can see if there is pieces of wood, they're way smaller. You can also see these white things called perlite. They're gonna help with the slow release of water for your seedlings, but they're not gonna be so big that they're gonna crush your seedlings. So you wanna use this. And if you got a bag of potting mix, you would see it kind of looks like somewhere in between this and the garden bed mix because it has things like perlite because it's in a pot, but it has those big chunks of wood too. Now. There are people out there, they'll tell you, you could take a colander or a sifter and get all the big chunks out. And that is totally doable. That is something that you can do. But as a beginner, I would try to keep things as simple as possible. So I would just buy a seed starting mix. You can go with the brand I'm using and pick it up right here or pick another brand. It doesn't really matter. They're generally gonna work the same. And that's the thing. There's actually quite a few right ways to do this. Multiple brands that work. You can even make this stuff at home. I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible. And I'll make recommendations to what I'm using throughout this video. And there's going to be like a store link somewhere around this video that you can use and see all the things I'm using. But I'm going to be describing kind of the key things you should be looking for in each of these things. So if you have something at home or something readily available, use that first. Don't buy something because I'm very much in the mindset of waste not, want not. But I know as a beginner, you're probably missing some of these pieces. So I'll give you some links so that you can just get them. <laughs> Let's talk rehydrating soil, AKA how do you make it not dusty and dry? And in the vein of also waste not want not, here's one of my kids buckets. You can buy any bucket and do this. It doesn't matter. It just needs to be a container with no holes. Now we need to talk about how we're going to rehydrate the soil because the soil you're going to buy at the store, well, it is dusty dry. If you look at my hand, wow so dry most of the dirt's not sticky and that's because it has been totally dried out before it's put in this bag now you may think why would they do that why would they do that well it's really to prevent mold from growing in here <laughs> you don't want mold growing in your soil that you're going to try to grow your plants in because honestly ugh. so they dehydrate it and now it's our job to rehydrate it. so get yourself a bucket and you're gonna put some soil in there. Now I like to work in small bits at a time, which is why I'm using a smaller bucket because if I added all the soil in here and didn't use it, well, it's gonna start to grow mold at some point. So if you're not planning to use it in the next week or two, I would honestly just recommend getting something smaller or just adding small amounts at a time. Personally, I have a ton of trays to get started, but we're only gonna start a few today just so I can keep us focused as beginners. Now there's kind of two ways you could do this. You could just dump some soil, eyeball it for how much you need. Or if you want to be a little bit more precise, you could take whatever size tray you're going to do and fill it to the top and then dump it in. And then you would know that's about how much soil you need. That way you don't overdo it. Now for me, I've got a lot, a lot of trays to fill. <laughs> so I'm not as worried about how much I'm going to put in here. Now the big thing when we're going to rehydrate this dusty, dusty soil is that we want to do it in this separate container and not inside the trays at first because we need to mix it. Because basically, since this is all dried out, it's imagine your sponge at your sink. You know how if you haven't washed anything in a while, it gets so dry. And then when you first put it under the faucet, the water all just bounces off. It's kind of the same thing that's going to happen here. So we have to add the water and then mix, 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 mix to really get the water absorbed in here. If you wanna kinda of do this the best way is you mix it the night before and then you kinda of let it sit overnight 
that would be the best way. You'll be able to tell really quickly if you've added too much water or not enough. But as a beginner, you might be like me and be like, well, I don't wanna wait overnight. I wanna do this now and that's okay. And that's the way we're gonna do it right now. So next up, we're gonna slowly add some water. You can kind of see the, the soil is floating around. That's normal. That's because it hasn't absorbed anything yet. So we're just gonna mix and mix and mix. And eventually you're gonna see some of this is gonna to start to look like mud. Now you may be wondering, what kind of water can I use? Can I use my normal tap water? Can I use from the hose? Either is totally fine. Look, we're not going for perfect here. We're not going for precise here. We're going for good enough here because you're a beginner. So just use tap water. Just buy the seed starting mix. People will come and tell you there are better ways to do it. And as you get good at things, you work towards those better things. But in the beginning, cheap, easy, readily available. If you haven't added enough water, you're just gonna keep adding a little bit of water at a time until you have enough. This is too much. You see how the water is just draining out of the soil. Now, if you're in this situation, what you can do is you can just grab a handful of dirt at a time and just add it back in until it's thicker. You see how I'm lifting it? And then what I do is I smash it back down. That kind of forces the soil and the water to combine. What you want to avoid is there being like dry pockets because that can not be good for your seedlings. Oh, that looks good. Look at that. Let's look at it now. You don't see any water dripping out. That's good. But if we squeezed it, there's water in there. And look at that. Now look at how the soil sticks to my hand. <laughs> so this is what we started with. And then look when I drop it. See the difference in how my hand looks? How much darker versus how much drier? If I go like this, look how much comes off this hand, look how much doesn't. And now we have nice soil that is properly rehydrated. I'm not worried about that little amount of water that keeps coming out. That will be taken care of by my seed tray. Now, since we're doing rehydrating, we do, you could have filled it from your sink or a hose, but one of the things, whether you do that initially, you are gonna wanna invest in a watering can when it comes to this project, you want it to come out gently like that. So one of the things you're gonna to wanna to look for is it needs to have one of these shower spouts. So you wanna find a <laughs> watering can that has kind of those small holes all around. That one is like a one gallon. I like one that's more like a half gallon. It's a little bit easier to control around seedlings and it can be even a little bit gentler. But if you're looking for one just to get started, whichever, wherever this link is <laughs> below, go ahead and grab one of those. Now you may have been wondering if you already have seed trays is why couldn't we have just put the soil in here and then added the water? Well, the thing is, is that you saw how crucial having a shovel to shove that soil around. So what can often happen is if we just would have done it straight in the tray, well, we'll get these dry pockets. So you'll see the top will look wet. You'll see the bottom might even look wet. The edges might look wet, but there'll be a huge center chunk. It's not unusual that stays absolutely dry. And that can be a problem because when your seedling starts and its roots start going down, it hits these dry pockets and it just all the water out of them. So we like to do the mixing outside the tray so we can be sure that the soil is totally mixed before we put it in the tray. Now you may be wondering, is there anything special with what shovel you use? A simple gardening shovel, all you really need. Now there are three typical gardening shovels you'll see out there. I only carry two of them because they typically come in sets. This one is what we call a transplanting shovel. It's a little bit harder to use for these things because you can see it comes to a point and we kind of need like a flat edge, but you can use this for filling trays later. I just tend to use the generic gardening shovel. There is one that's really good that has like a bigger scoop for moving soil around, but it'll be a little bit harder for filling the trays. Again, if you have any one of these, you can make it work. It might be a little bit messier. It might not be as efficient, but honestly, if you have it, use it. If you don't have one, go ahead and pick up one right here. Let's talk seed trays and what you need to be looking for in your seed tray because not all seed trays are equal and this can make a difference. The key thing that you want in your seed tray, no matter what brand or how you got it, you want it to have slits along the sides 
and some sort of opening in the bottom. It does. This allows any extra water when you're watering these seedlings to come out so that you don't one, drown your little baby plants or two, grow a bunch of mold. So we want slits on the side and a slit on the bottom. This is a tray you can buy, here it is. But you might have some of these lying around if you've bought plants before. You can see this one has them on the bottom. It doesn't have them on the side. Now, if you don't have ones that have slits on the side, you won't get what's called air pruning. What is that? Air pruning is basically, pruning just means like cutting. And then air pruning means that when the little roots grow out, when they hit the air, they will basically just stop themselves from growing in that direction. If they don't have that, like this tray, they'll grow around and around and around and around until you move them into something bigger. So what will that mean? Well, honestly, what that'll mean is that you just need to move these plants up or into the ground faster. That, that's it, that's all it's gonna mean. So if you have something that doesn't have slits on the side, it's fine. This is from, remember I said, there's a lot of right ways to do it. Initially, I buy a lot of plants when I was a newer gardener, and therefore, I just kept a bunch of these trays. You might be able to find them on Facebook Marketplace. You might already have some in your garage or, or in your garden shed. I have tons of these around. When it comes to seed starting, if you have some of these around, getting ones that are in six cells or four cells, that's what we call them. So see six places for plants, four places for plants. These are great. I like them when they're the smaller size because you don't use up a ton of soil getting your seedling started. Because if you're not planning on keeping in pots long-term, you don't want, you don't need them. You don't need a lot. <laughs> so these are kind of my favorite. These are ones I've reused over and over again. Try to reuse these over and over again. Eventually they break when you go to pop the plants apart, but you might get a season or two out of them. So if you have them around, use them. Now if you don't have anything and you're not planning on buying anything, you might just want to get something like this. These are a lot sturdier, so they're going to be better for popping plants out because they have a hole at the bottom that you can just boop, you just boop the plant out. So I prefer for long-term for this, like I said, waste not, want not. If you want to get these ones, you can get them right here. What about all these ones, Jacqueline? You have these ones too. Yeah, these are good. They just fall over a lot more. Now, another thing you want to look for is the material that you're going to be using. So you can see this is not very flexible these things are very flexible. Depending on the type of material is these will tend to crack over time once you use them over and over again. These, as long as they have slits, are better because they will not tend to crack as easily. But if they don't have slits, you're never getting this plant out. You're gonna like kill the plant trying to get it out of the top. So you have to have something like a hole in the bottom so you can boop and just like pop it out. So that's one of the things. Enough about the seed trays. We've got the seed trays we want. Let's fill them. So I've got my little six cell C tray and I'm going to take my shovel and I'm gonna just smush it on. <laughs> this, you should feel very comfortable getting your hands dirty. Now, one of the things we wanna watch out for is that all the soil doesn't come out the bottom. We can grab it by hand. Now you might think, how high should I fill it? Because you've already rehydrated your soil, you can fill them up pretty close to the top. Don't do a lot of squishing because you're going to squeeze all the water back out. Nah, that's not true. You're not going to squeeze all the water out. But you don't want to be pushing it so much that it just all falls out the bottom. If you got this type. The other types of trays, it's not as easy to push all the soil out of the bottom. And what you don't want to do when you're filling it is you don't want to be pushing it down, making it as compact as possible, because now it's going to make it really hard for your little baby seedling to make any way through all this. Also, it's going to be harder. So let me pop that out. So we don't want to smush it. We're just gently just kind of pushing it in. Put some new stuff in there. Gentle, gentle. I push a little bit lightly. But I'll tell you, looser is better in the initially than really smashing it. Because if you do it too loose, all that's gonna happen is when you water it, it'll just get lower and lower. And that is okay, because most of your seedlings, you can always add soil back around later on when you move them into bigger containers or into the ground. So there you go. That's what it looks like. Da -da, da -da -da. And now we put it. So you can see all that soil I had is only gonna fill about two of these little trays. The, you could use a shovel, it would be neater, but I really don't worry about that, honestly. Getting your hands in the dirt is good for you. Now we're at the point of the seeds. Yes, the seeds, the whole reason you came here in the first place is to put the seeds in the soil and now we're ready to do that. But here are a couple of things that might help you as a beginner. 
in general, if the plant has bigger seeds, it tends to be easier when you're new. Plants like beans and all your squashes, kind of like pumpkins, tend to be easier to get started. They may not be easier to keep alive long run, but to get started. And the reason is, is one, they tend to be a bit more forgiving with how deep you put them. Two, they are way faster to pop up. So you don't have to spend as much time fussing at the plant as you do some of the other ones. See, here's the thing. Your seedlings might not work out and it has nothing to do with you. You did all the things right. It was too hot. It got too cold. Their rain smashed it to death. That's a common thing that happens in Florida. But also different seed companies have different what are called germination rates. This company, Southern Exposure, they actually put their germination rate on the packet. You might say to yourself, what is a germination rate? Germination rate basically says, if I take 10 seeds, 90% of them are supposed to sprout. So if I get 10 seeds, nine of them should sprout. On this packet, it says 95%. So that means if I got 100 seeds, 95 of them should sprout. But some of the companies don't have that good of germination rates. Their rates are more in the 70 percentile. And also if the packet's old, then it drops down to 50% or 35%. So you could do everything right. And if these seed packets have a bad germination rate, or they got exposed to too much humidity or something, they just might not work. Which is why it's good to go with a good quality brand. I like Southern Exposure. They do really well for me down in Florida. There are a lot of good companies out there. And of course, if you know good companies, put them down in the comments because, hey, we're all on a learning journey. Also give what location you're from so that people who are from similar locations can also use them too. Now let's talk opening the seed packet. So when we go to open our seed packet, you don't wanna be a wild person like me and just tear it off, unless you know for sure that you're gonna use the whole thing. But if you are not, this is a bad idea because one, like this packet, it'll dump everywhere. Two, is if you have to hold it in a humid climate like mine, your germination rate, it's gonna go down. So what you wanna do instead is gently peel this open. And what's cool is these are set up so that they can stick back together again later on so that you can just store them. And that way, if you don't use all of them right now or all your seedlings take off and you hold these all the way till next year, it's a great thing. You waste not, why not? Remember we talked about that. Okay, let's put the seeds in the ground. So in this tray, we're gonna do a bigger seed like black turtle, drying beans, these are black bean. And then this tray, we'll do a little seed, Cherokee purple tomatoes. So we're gonna gently open this packet. Now I find it best to usually put a little handful. Just what I don't wanna do is add dirt and water on my fingers and keep putting it back in this packet because guess what might happen? You might have little baby sprouts in your seed packet. <laughs> so we wanna keep them separate. So here we got some seeds. We're gonna do, you can do with beans. Usually it's one to two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna count these out. So I got two, four, six, So there's a couple of these seedlings, they look a little bit tinier than the other ones. Other ones look nice and juicy and big. So these ones I'll plant by themselves, but this one I'll plant with somebody. So these ones, it says you can do one inch deep. Now, if you want an idea for one inch, that's like that amount. At a minimum, you always wanna do it as deep as the seed is long. That's a general rule of thumb. So you can either do this and then stick your seed in, boop. You can see I'm not actually going a whole inch. I'm going more like a half inch. You, It's easier to go less than more. So I'm gonna go like this. You can see I'm actually going to about my fingernail, which is about a half inch. And I'm putting one. And one of the things I like to do is I do all the holes first. So I got them all about the same amount. Also, so I don't forget where I put them and not put them. So there's two in there, boop. One in there, two in there. You can see some of them are kind of sticking up so I can push them a little bit further. And now I'm gonna cover them. And usually what I do with my kids is we say, night night. And that is beans. So now let me show you the difference with tomato seedling. Now look at the difference in these seeds. I mean, this is a big difference. Only in how big, but also how thin they are. And it's the same idea. We only wanna put them in as deep 
as they are long, which for this is barely anything. So what I do with these ones is I make a little, basically as long as my nail is past my finger, I'm just making the tiniest of holes. Very different, right? I'm not shoving my finger in. I'm just making this little dimple. Because these seeds are so small, I tend to do two or three. Some people even use tweezers if you have a hard time with your fingers. That's not a bad idea. Whatever works so that you can get them in. Did I even put some here? Oh, there's just like one lonely one. You also want to consider putting a little bit more with your tomatoes because they tend to take longer. Where this is like 7 to 14 days, this can usually take people 21, even 28 days, depending on your weather. So you can see I gently put them in. Let's go a little closer. And now we're going to just gently move a little bit of soil over them. Now you may be wondering yourself, or actually because you're a beginner, you might not even know to wonder this, which is, should I start in a tray or should I just put it right in the garden? And in general, you can start most stuff in the tray or you could put it in the garden. There's reasons that are gonna depend on where you live for what we will recommend. So I live in Florida and we are hot and warm most of the year. But that also means we have bugs a lot of the year that are gonna eat little seedlings. So we tend to wanna start a lot of stuff in trays because of bugs. For other places like Northerners, they have short, hot windows. So if they wanna grow things like loofah or okra, they kinda need to start them somewhere that's hot and that they can control temperature more because they just don't have that many hot days. But whether you live very far north or you live very far south like I do, you're gonna wanna always start these ones in ground. That's gonna be carrots, beets, radishes, basically your root crops. If the thing you eat is the root, then it should start in the ground where it's gonna grow the whole time. So now some of you might be asking yourselves, but Jacqueline, I live in a similar climate to you and I wanna know exactly what you're gonna be growing. And if you wanna know the vegetables that work for us down in zone eight, zone nine, zone 10 and 11, you can check out this video. I'll go ahead and link it at the end or you can just click this link right here. Now we get to the mistake I make the most, even as someone who's really experienced. That is, I don't label my trays. I am so bad about this. And a month from now, it's gonna be like, what was this? <laughs> So there are a lot of right answers. You can be fancy and cute and like get one of these labels, plant labels that can then follow out into the garden. I have not tended to use those. I'll just use like masking tape and we just write on the trays. And then I just mark it in my planner on exactly what I put where. And if you want to get this planner, this is my Wild Floridian Garden Planner. It will also keep you on track. You can pick it up at this link right here. To keep things really simple today, I'm just going to be using some popsicle sticks. <laughs> now with the popsicle stick, you will want to use like a permanent marker because if you use a washable marker, uh, well, it rains here, so it will wash away. So we always use a permanent marker. Same thing with chalk, doesn't work very well for me. So what you're gonna wanna note on it is what type of plant and what variety. That's kind of your key information. So here we've got our black turtle, black beans, and then I've got my purple Cherokees. You wanna just pick up some popsicle sticks? Here you go. <laughs> now we have our seeds in their trays, but now what? How do we get these things to sprout? Now, first off, make your life easier, especially if you get the same seed trays I have, get yourself a watering tray with it. Because one of the challenges with these tiny seedlings and this little of soil is they dry out super fast. So by getting a tray, you can actually fill this slightly and what it'll do is it'll keep your soil wetter longer. Because if you're a busy person who has to go to work, take care of the kids, have lots of chores, lots of activities to do, you cannot be fussing at these plants multiple times a day. So this will buy you time so that you only have to check it once a day, every other day, and keep your plants on track. 
Now it's kind of one of those catch 22s because in the beginning you might only have to put water in every other day, every third day, maybe even fifth day. But once the plants get started, the frequency increases, especially as they get older. Once you have a tomato that's like two weeks, three weeks old, you might find that you need to fill up that watering tray every day. And honestly, that's a pretty clear sign that you should get either that plant into a bigger pot or just get it out in the garden. And just a friendly reminder, of course, when you're watering from the top, you want to have one of those gentle dripping watering cans. You don't want to have something like your hose that you put on full maximum spray and then just like pressure wash your seeds away. The other thing you need to think about is where are you going to put this tray because every place isn't great. Now, if you live up north, you need to probably keep it inside because it's cold out, but I don't live where it's north. It's hot out. Like I'm sweating a lot. I know it might not show up on camera, but I am. And for us, one, we have so much reflective light down here in the south that you don't need to even put your little seedlings out into a sunny area. It's actually better to keep them protected. And for me, I know my Floridians, they love this tip because I always remind them we get seeds started in August and September and usually there's a rain or a tropical storm or a hurricane that kills everybody's seedlings. So keeping them on a patio or a covered area, especially with some sort of netting or screen around it is really key because we have a lot of bugs still that can quickly eat all your little seedlings to nothing. And again, friendly reminder, remember seeds have different times that they take to get going. So typically beans, squashes, that's seven to 14 days. But if you're in warmer climates like Florida, you're gonna be closer to seven. When it comes to things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, you're gonna be more in that 14 to 21 days, but it can be sped up if it's hotter or slowed down if it's colder. So knowing some of those particulars, but if you stick to kind of the common varieties, the seed package should in general give you a pretty good clue on how long it's going to take. If it's gone a week or two weeks beyond whatever the seed package says, well, you've had some sort of problem and you're gonna to need to start over again. Now, while I've gone over a lot of tips and a lot of things to think about, you might still have some questions, so please put them down in the comments. I will try to answer as many as I can. Plus, those inspire future videos, just like this video right here, seven mistakes to avoid when starting seeds. Or if you're looking for vegetable varieties that work, go ahead and check out this video here. Or you can pick up all the items that I just talked about in the shopping store over here or down there. And okay, I'll see you soon. Bye.